Our next speaker is CTSC, the Center for Trustworthy Scientific Cyber Infrastructures, Mark Krenz, and his presentation is Using Auk to Analyze Bro Logs. Welcome, Mark. Hello, thank you for coming back after the break. I know it gets hard in the afternoon after you've had a lot to eat and some snacks and stuff. What was that that she said about interrupting the speaker? <laughs> You know, I thought, it was, I, when I saw the, the doors without handles, I thought, it's kind of like Unix, you know, you have standard out and standard in. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, AUK. This is a little bl blurb about the Center for Trustworthy Cyber, uh, Cyber Infrastructure. We basically support science projects, uh, help them out with their cybersecurity awareness. Uh, a number of institutions, including NCSA, are involved in it. Uh, this is a little blurb about me. I work at Indiana University's uh, Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, another four-letter acronym, uh, for the past five years, and um, am part of the CTSC group. Uh, I'm also the creator of a popular Twitter feed called CLI Magic. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I can see there's a number of followers. Um, and uh, a little bit about what we're going to go over today. So we're going to cover the command line, and I promise it won't hurt. I'll make it easy. Um, basically break it down into its component parts and not look at it as a whole. Uh, we'll cut, I'll give a little bit of a primer about regular expressions and the awk command, how it uh, works. And then I'll give you real examples of how you can use awk to discover uh, incidents on your, in your bro logs or uh, do statistics on your bro logs. And also at the end, I have a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, these slides will be available after the talk, so don't feel the need to quickly type in you know, the commands that you see on the screen. Uh, they'll be made available so that you can uh, copy and paste from a PDF or, or a PowerPoint. So uh, I started using these uh, color coding in uh, my slides to make it a little bit easier for you to uh, discern the syntax of the commands. Command names are in green, uh, the options are in light blue, the file names that are referenced are in orange, uh, the aux script, which is uh, the meat of what we'll be talking about, is in yellow, the output of the commands is in red, and then the pipeline and redirection characters are in white, and comments are in gray. If you're colorblind, I'm sorry, everything will just, you know, you'll just have to parse the syntax. Uh, so when we work with uh, bro logs, there's a number of different command line commands that we can work with. Uh, a lot of people, you know, maybe use cat and grep and less and, and just do manual searches. Uh, using bro cut is great for uh, changing the timestamps so you can read the timestamps. And I use bro cut in conjunction with awk. Don't think that they're in competition with each other. Uh, you use them together and they make a good team. And then passing them from that into other commands like sort and unique and WC. And then there's a bunch of other ones um, that you can work with. So uh, the pattern of a awk script, how many of you currently use awk to, uh, let me reverse this, how many of you do not use awk to analyze, and please raise your hand because it's good to know. The program committee wasn't sure where to accept my talk because they thought that everybody already knew how to use awk. But I think that with Bro's growth, there's a lot of new people that are using Bro who aren't familiar with these command line tools and uh, need to be shown what's, what can be done. So the basic pattern of awk is to uh, say awk and then uh, give it an option. In, uh, in Bro's case, you want to give it the tab delimited um, the tab delimited character option, and then the program of the bro, uh, the program that you want to run in awk uh, script, and then a file name or two or three, or pass the input from standard input into awk. We'll talk about that in a second. So uh, in awk, if you want to reference a column, you use dollar one, dollar two, dollar three for column one, two, and three. Uh, this is called an action statement. It's in like um, curly braces. If you don't have an action statement, the default action is to print the line. Uh, the whole line is referenced by dollar zero. And then, like I said, the columns are one, two, up to NF, which is the last column. Um, but you can just give it 
column names. So if you want to make a comparison and you want to say if the second column is equal to the string foo, then you would just say dollar two equals equals foo. Uh, if you want to say not foo, then you'd say uh, exclamation point equals foo, which is a common way of saying not equals to uh, in many languages. Uh, if you want to use a regular expression, you'd use the tilde character and then two slashes and then the regular expression inside. This would match Betty with a capital or lowercase b uh, in the third column. And then uh, you can have logical statements, true or false, true and true, um, and so on. You can use uh, parentheses to give uh, uh, priority to a certain statement like you would in a math equation. And then you can set variables. Uh, so it's just variable equals the value that you want to set to. So how a command pipeline works, if you're not familiar with it, is that you have things called standard input, standard output, like I was saying with the doors, uh, where you start a program and then that program generates some kind of text and it sends the output of that command into the input of the next command. So in this case, we're sending the output of running zcat, which is taking the con log that's been compressed and decompressing and sending it out to this, the terminal, and instead sending it to the input of awk. And then with awk, we're saying, okay, uh, tab delimited file, print the third column, and then send that output onto another set of programs, and this is called the pipeline. You know, you have a series of these vertical pipes. Uh, send it into sort, so you sort the IPs, you get the unique count of IPs, and then you sort that list, and you get a top list of IP addresses that have connected to you um, over time. Uh, regular expressions, this is a woozy, but um, I'm gonna go over it quickly. So a regex is basically just a search pattern. Uh, you would uh, enclose it in double quotes. Probably you want to enclose it within uh, single quotes to protect uh, dollar signs from being uh, handled by the shell. Um, and then a single dot will match any single character in that position. Uh, you want to backslash that dot if you actually mean a real literal period uh, in an expression. That's important, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, a dot with a star after it means match any character zero or more times, which probably isn't what you really want. So you want to say dot and plus, which means match any character one or more times. Instead of the dot, you can have any character class. You know, you can say a range of characters or something, followed by a star or a plus uh, to quantify it. If you put a hat like this in a regular expression, uh, it matches the beginning of the line. Um, and a dollar sign matches the end of the line. When I say line, uh, if you're working in awk, it also could mean the actual string value. So if I say dollar three tilde and then uh, use the hat and the dollar, then that's going to match just that string value for the third column, not the entire uh, line of the, of the uh, bro log record. Uh, and then you can use character classes, like if you want to say match any character A through Z, you can put them in uh, square brackets. If uh, you can have multiple different ranges, so upper and lower case, letters A through Z and zero through nine. If you want to say not a character in that class, uh, you, put a, you put a hat uh, or a caret before the actual range. So this would say match any character that's not zero through nine. And then you can also quantify it using uh, curly braces. Again, regular expressions are, are a topic all their own, so uh, went over that in two minutes. Uh, so a lot of people, when they run uh, programs like grep you know, on a log, and they use some kind of regular expression to match something, they don't consider that they, they're, not, they're using kind of a fuzzy matching because they're not being precise in uh, what they're matching in a column. Uh, they're not considering that there might be trailing, uh, you know, their, their search pattern might match a substring of a value or something like that. So you want to use uh, as much context as possible. Here in this case, that regular expression is very precise. It's saying the IP address 2.4.150.1 uh, to search for that IP address. So, so a lot of people tend to just do this and then they, um, the problem with this is that it also matches this IP and this IP and 
these values, you know, those aren't even IP addresses. And a script, you know, in a URL, those aren't the things that you're looking for, but you get them anyways because you didn't, you weren't very precise with your regexes. So even veterans of the command line and, and of awk and uh, these tools tend to, you know, they forget that they're doing this fuzzy matching and then you end up blaming Apache struts for your data breach. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, when we're detecting host, uh, so here's a uh, use of awk. Detect hosts uh, searching for exploitable code uh, on your website or any web server in the case of Bro um, or any web request that's being made over your network. So which, uh, one thing you might want to do is say which IP had the most HTTP 404 not found errors. Uh, so you think, what is a 404 not found error? Well, it's a HTTP return status returned by the client when it makes a request for a certain URL the web server sends back this code to the client. Uh, how many people didn't know that? Or didn't know it well? Okay, I, everybody seems to know this concept of a 404, but maybe they just think not found. They don't really think of the context. Um, so what logs can we look at to track this information? Uh, bro's HTTP.log. And what field is it in the bro log? The status code. So there's this column called status code that will uh, show you all the the uh, return status codes that um, Bro detects in the HTTP protocol uh, request being made. Uh, then how can we match a number in a log? Well, awk is probably the best option. You could also use grep and give it some context of the tabs uh, around a 404, but you might match error things is the problem, uh, which is why it's better to use awk because you can be very specific saying this column uh, and this value in this column. And then how can we generate a top list, which will give us the information that we're looking for? Uh, well, we can collect the groups like we did with the IP addresses using sort, and then we can pass them into unique C and then sort that list again. So here's the command. Um, so uh, we start with catting the log into brocut, and here's a great example of using brocut and awk together. Um, because we don't really care about you know, all the columns in the bro log in this case, we just want two. Uh, so we get the origin host and then the status code from uh, bro cut. We pass that into awk, telling awk that the columns are gonna be separated by uh, tabs because normally awk will separate them by any type of white space. And the problem with that is that once you start getting into uh, columns that have white space in them, like a browser user agent or something like that, then your columns end up getting messed up and you have to consider the fact that you, know, you might have, uh, from awk's point of view, you might have a varying number of column numbers. So you have to tell it the format of the bro log. Uh, so this will, look at the second column, in this case, which is stats code, and say if the value is a text string 404, here I'm not using a regular expression, here I'm being precise. I'm saying if it's a 404, then sort, you know, pass all that out of awk into sort, sort the list, and then get the, uh, the top requester. And so here at the end we get this IP address, it's made 165 uh, HTTP requests that return not found. And then we might take that and look at, oh, it's a Koala scan, so it's not even an attacker. It's just, you know, like ZMAP or something. Um, no offense to ZMAP, I use ZMAP, it's great. Uh, so uh, another thing we might want to do is detect if a web app tried to read the file system. Um, you can do this also with the uh, HTTP log. Um, like if somebody's trying to exploit something in WordPress to see if it can read some file uh, on the Unix file system. So what would we search for? Well, we'd search for something like a file system reference indicator, like a slash or a dot dot, or you know, a specific directory like slash Etsy, or specific interesting file names like my.conf, um, or passwd, or htaccess, or something that an attacker might want to read. Uh, how can we figure out if it worked? If it returns a 404, then probably it didn't work. If it's a 200, it only means that it potentially worked in the return status. We would still have to manually check uh, to see if that file really exists because a 200 would only mean that the web server uh, answered for that script uh, URL that you passed it. 
So you'd have to check. So this is just a quick example of what the HTTP log looks like in case you don't color code it to see the columns. So you can see how you know, it, it has the post and, and the uh, 200, 201 and stuff, those kind of codes and the URI. So here we uh, just run awk, kind of like running grep, but instead we give it a specific column name. The tenth column is the uh, URI column. And note, I have to backslash the dots so that I'm not just matching any character, I'm matching literal uh, periods. So this would just search for dot dot slash. Uh, and it's going to search for it. Note, I didn't use the caret and the dollar sign in the regular expression. It's going to match it anywhere in the URI. Um, so in this case, it comes back, and you see in bold here, it matches this section where uh, somebody was trying to exploit the rev slider plugin of WordPress to uh, search for my.com files. This was a real attack that I pulled this from. Uh, Okay, uh, detect if a new exploit uh, that we, you know, this is one thing where Bro shines, is being able to store a lot of logs about your network data and go back later and do forensics and, and see if you've been bit by a, a new exploit in the past. So earlier this year, the Intel AMT vulnerability uh, came out that's been in chips since 2010. So it's like, wow, you know, that's a long time, but some people might actually have logs going back that far. So uh, is there any way we can detect this? Well, we're looking for metadata about uh, the two ports that Intel AMT service listens on, which is 16992 and 16993. Um, and we can find this in bros.con.log file. Of course, this would only tell us if somebody tried to initiate a connection to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they've actually exploited anything, and it doesn't even mean if the connection was successful. But we can check the con status uh, column in the con log uh, to see if it's not S0, then probably it means that it was in more interesting traffic. You know, that's that way of going up the pyramid and ruling out the normal traffic and looking for the more interesting stuff that the speaker earlier was talking about. Uh, and then we make a list of potential attackers first uh, because not every single you know, um, person, not every connection that's going to match our query is going to be uh, a potential attacker. They might just be a port scanner that came across these ports uh, or they might just be looking for Intel, people running the Intel AMT service. They might not know about the vulnerability. And then we go back and investigate the overall activity um, of the potential attackers. So in this case, um, so we go back and we look through seven years of data. That wild card up there is going to match all your bro. Yeah. So uh, you're going to go back through seven years of data and uh, look at the con logs, z catting them out so that. Um, you know, it's decompressing them. Passing that into cat and combining it with the current log, you don't have to do this this way, but you know, it just shows how you can use cat to combine the standard input with another file. And then passing that into awk, uh, saying, um, you know, if the port, which is the sixth column, is one of the Intel AMT ports and the twelfth column, which is the con status, isn't, you know, exclamation point equals, is not S0, uh, then print this out to the potential attackers. Um, so print the third column, which is the origin host, out to this file and redirect it so that the potential attackers file is filled up with these IP addresses. And then you go back uh, and you zgrep, um, you can use zgrep to basically, you're using the potential attackers as a list of search expressions to go through. And that's what that dash lowercase f means. The dash capital F means take every single line and treat it as a, a regular string, not a regular expression. This speeds up grep. Uh, so pass that into uh, the potential attackers. Use that to search against all the logs um, for output. And you, know, you get a hacker, maybe, if you're lucky. Or actually, you don't want to find one, right? <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at logins versus uh, non-work time. So you, one thing you might be interested in is are people connecting to your network outside of normal working hours 
or maybe during interesting times like a party or, or something like that. So what service do we want to check in, uh, check against? Our favorite service, SSH, uh, because Bro provides this nice log that uh, consolidates all the SSH information onto one line instead of bringing it across into multiple lines like in syslog or something like that. How can we compare the time of day? So we can use BroCut to actually convert the, t the timestamp column to a local time and then we can use aux sub str, which stands for substring um, in programmer lingo, uh, to get just the hour out of that timestamp. So a bit about how sub str works. You give it a string value uh, and then a starting index. And note that in awk, indexes start from one, not zero like they do in every other programming language. So yeah, of course, this way makes more sense to non-programmers, I guess. So, um, and then you give it a length of the substring. So uh, if you have a string like this as easy and you just want to get easy out of it, you'd start at the ninth column and you'd take four characters in and that would give you just easy. So if we have a timestamp, and here I'm showing that the first column is set to that timestamp, 2017, uh, so on. Then we want to take the first column as the string value, go in 12 uh, characters, and then take two characters, and that'll give us just the hour of the day. So then uh, to make comparisons, uh, first, you know, when we're working with the logs, we want to skip the lines that... Uh, that are comment characters like the log header. So that dollar not tilde um, equals to uh, hash at the beginning of the line is what does that. You'll see that in the final result. And then we say the fourth column, uh, which is the success or not of the SSH connection, and the fifth column, which is whether it's inbound or outbound, we do these comparisons to filter out our results. Uh, you want to do... Um, you know, if you want to compare something and do one thing if it's true and another thing if it's false, then you'd use an if-else statement like this. So we end up with, like, if the hour is less than 9 or, or if the hour is greater than or equal to 15 or 17, which is 5 o'clock or later, then print it out uh, because that's what we care about. It's um, people working, you know, logging in outside normal working hours. Uh, another quicker, you know, another shorter way to write out an if-else statement is using the logical operators like this. You might see this in some of the examples. So um, we, we cat in ssh.log, and this is only going to look at you know, the current log session. Uh, it's not going to combine it with the zcat, but you could combine it with zcat if you want. Pass into brocut just to get the columns we care about in this case. Uh, timestamp, the origin host, the response host, the auth success, and the direction, and then start running these comparisons. If the for, you know if auth success is true and the direction is inbound, then let's get the hour and set a variable called hour to, uh, and that int means convert the string, you know, of the hour to an integer. Uh, that way we can do a numerical comparison on it. Um, so we set hour to be the actual hour part of the timestamp, then we say if hour is uh, less than 9 or greater than 5 o'clock, essentially, uh, then print it out and pipe it into less. And look how fast that was. That was so fast. You want to say that again? Watch this. <laughs> that was so fast. I, don't, I can't think of any system that might go faster than that. You know. I, I was a bit worried, you know, after coming in after Justin's. I mean, the, the click house or brick house or whatever it was called was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, although I was a bit more worried when I saw everybody raise their hand for the JSON log thing. Because, I, yeah, I don't, I can't help you with that. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, another alternate way that I came up with once of doing this is to use the modulus operator against the epic time that you have in, as the default value in the logs, uh, the number of seconds since 1970. Uh, so just to go over this really quick, if you modulo the Unix epic against A6400, which is the number of seconds in a day, then you will get the same, no same time of day, no matter what day it is, like any time. 
so if you, if you calculate what your local, you have to do this in local time, if you calculate what your local seconds would be from the start of the day, you could do the same calculation uh, using modulo and the Unix epoch time. And um, like this would be the one for uh, Eastern, Eastern daylight time, I think. So just another way to do it. One of the crazy examples I come up with for CLI magic on a regular basis. Uh, okay, so uh, before we go into the next example, I want to explain arrays a bit. So arrays uh, can be used to store values either in awk, it's either uh, numeric values or string values. Uh, you can use it to store IP addresses, but awk doesn't have any understanding of what an IP address is. It just uses it as a string value. Uh, and then you can perform operations on its values, like the length, the, you know, um, is one thing greater than the other, and stuff like that. Uh, this shows how I would assign uh, Tabitha Gallagher, the string, somebody's name, into the first index of the array called A. And this is another uh, array that's called U, that I, instead of using an index number, I use a um, associative array key you know, the username uh, to say this user's user, uh, this username's real name is Tabitha Gallagher. You know, you define it however you want. This shows another example where I'd use like a, con a cons array that I make up and it's made up of IP pairs, maybe the from and to host and maybe the value is the number of connections made between those two hosts. So that would be a good example of, of the way you'd use an array in awk. You can also have multi-dimensional arrays. I'm not going to get into that today because it, it's a lot more involved. But basically you have an array of arrays, so each array value can be another array. And you can uh, store you know, multiple different things for each username or each IP address. Uh, and then, like I said, you can perform operations on arrays. This would get the number of actual values inside the array. So it's a way of counting uh, the number of you know, users or connection pairs or whatever uh, you're storing. So let's say we want to detect a brute force attack, whether it actually succeeded or not. Um, SSH, yes, uh, because it provides great information. Thank you, Seth. Uh, how can, uh, so how to keep track of failures. Uh, if, if we have a failure, then let's increment the value in an array for a pair of IPs. So we'd create a key that has that, that pair of IPs, the from and the to, uh, and then we'd increment a value. So one, two, three, you know, for every failure that happens. And then if it's success and a fail count of that uh, IP pair has passed a certain threshold, say 20, so in other words 20 failures before success, then print out that line. Uh, and then if you have a successful connection, then delete the pairs so that we don't end up catching people who like fail a lot before they succeed and, and stuff like that. You know, they might like fail three times and then succeed. You don't want to do that. So you'd want to delete the successful connection uh, pairs to reset the count. We only care about if 20 happen, then a success happens or more. So here we cat out all of 2017's SSH log. Again, this is going to be lightning fast. Uh, and we pass into bro cut to get the columns that we want. And we create this uh, pair key of the third and fourth column, which in this case is the origin and response host. We make that a key value that we'll use to set a value in the array. So if the fifth column, which is the auth success, is equal to t or true, uh, then we increment the number of fails for that pair by one. Otherwise, uh, if if, in other words, the else is if the connection failed in some way. So otherwise, then uh, if the fails for the pair, for this key pair is over 20, then we pass that threshold and then we print out that line. So this would be, you know, the dollar zero would refer to the line in bro where they succeed. And then we put in the string afterwards that's kind of helpful that says they succeeded after, you know, 20, uh, 20 tries or whatever. And then we delete the fails pair key. And wow, that was fast. So this one succeeded after 5,082 tries. So yeah, that's probably not a good thing. That probably means somebody uh, failed, some username was in the top 10,000 dictionary or something like that, some password uh, for a user. 
Uh, how can we detect when somebody installs a backdoor? Um, so what type of service is being backdoored? SSH. You're going to see this over and over again. Um, how can we tell if it's being backdoored? Uh, a version number change. And this could be any piece of software, really. Um, so the server-side binary file or checksum uh, changes. We can look inside Bro's software log uh, to see when you know, when uh, the version went from one version to a different version. And then we can use awk to store the last version seen and compare it with the current lines version. Uh, if, uh, so this is the actual awk script we'd use. We'd set a variable. Uh, this kind of is what you can think of as happening first. So uh, we set a variable called last version, right? For every line that we see, we set to the fourth column value. And then for every other line after that, we say, if the last version is not equal to the current version, then print. It's actually a pretty easy program. You just have to think about it kind of in reverse. So you then you have something like this in your software log uh, where you have, you know, same version, same version. Oh, you know, the version changed. So we uh, do this command. And so in this case, I'm only looking at one host and one service. But you could set up a complex or you know, multi-dimensional array if you want to, to do this over any service, any host, any port, um, if you want to. So we do the same thing where we say, if, uh, if the host is that IP address at NCSA, I think, uh, then, and it's also port 22, then check the version numbers if they change, then print out. And it prints out these, just these two lines. It prints out the first line because last version hasn't been set, right? Okay, uh, you can use MySQL log analysis uh, with BroCut. So you, you, know, you get the rows that you want. Uh, you, if you want to see if uh, somebody, some query has returned over a certain number of rows, you can say if the fourth column of uh, row, which is rows returned, is greater than a certain value like 3,000, then print it out. You might also use this to deter, you know, there's an IP address. I say if the second column, the origin host, is uh, on this network and the the uh, query success was true, then print out. This might be, um, actually I say if it's not in your network. So this might be queries coming from the outside to an internal host and making successful queries, which you might care about. Uh, you can do large exfiltrations of data. Uh, so if you want to see if uh, queries are coming from, right, outbound transfer. So if the origin host is, Actually, I have that mixed up. OK, so if it's coming from this, this uh, network, 172.17.50, and it's transferred more than 100 million bytes, then print it out. Um, pretty easy stuff. Awk is commonly used for doing these kind of one-off queries that you do. But uh, you know, I always say, if, if you run something repeatedly, make a script for it, make it adaptable to any situation, and either run it from cron or run, it, run the script. You know, you don't have to remember this entire command line process. Uh, this is one way you can detect uh, Bro analyzes protocols, not necessarily just ports. So you can actually see whether a, a service is running uh, that doesn't match the standard port. So this would actually search for instances of SSH. You know, it's, it's looking at the service column, which is the fifth column in the output row cut, and it's saying if it's not, uh, or if it's port 80 or 443 and the service is SSH, then uh, print it out. And, you know, this is somebody trying to hide their SSH traffic on, on port 443, probably. Uh, so, wouldn't it be great? Um, one thing I wanted to offer everybody wouldn't it be great if you could just run awk commands like this without having to give it the tab delimiter and, and you know, the, remembering the column numbers and stuff like that. You could just uh, give it the actual column header values and uh, do GOIP lookups directly on the fly against, against host IPs and, and origin IPs and so on, and be able to do comparisons and print those out. 
uh, or maybe you want to be able to combine two logs together and do a lookup inside of one and then compare it with the entry in the con log based on the UID that's in the HTTP header log. Uh, so I made this program called um, Bok, uh, bro -oc. I anticipated the name change. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I made this program called Bok, uh, which does this. It's basically just a wrapper around the awk script, uh, which, which does all the heavy lifting. And here's how it does it. It actually uh, looks for the log headers, uh, the fields, line in the log headers and then loads all those values into an array. It doesn't do this for every single line, it only does it for the header line. And that is much faster than trying to load all the values for every line into an array and then read from those values. So when you actually go to reference it, what you do is you're referencing the number that's in this array. So you have to put dollar underscore b. Um, and there's the uh, GitHub URL at the bottom if you're interested. It's still kind of beta quality, uh, and I'd be more than interested to hear back uh, feedback from people um, about how you think it could be improved, uh, whether you like it or not. It will not handle JSON logs, but who knows, maybe in the future. Uh, so here's an example where I use the Bach program. Uh, I use Zcat. And then I reference specific header names and uh, to find people who might be doing video calls. Uh, so you can just see how it makes it a little bit more readable being able to see exactly uh, what column you're referencing when you make a more complex script. And like I said, uh, you know, don't necessarily run these long scripts uh, every time typing them in. Make scripts of your own that, that you can put into like a bin directory or something. And that's it. If you're interested in CTSC, uh, you know, I encourage you to check out trustedci.org. We have a webinar series and mailing list that you can check out. Uh, thank you to NCSA. And one thing I want to show, how many people saw this in the hotel? <laughs> and you know, it's funny. It's like I've seen this at Hampton Inns. Like, and every time I see it, I'm like, oh, cray cray. That's, yeah. Nobody gets that reference or something. It's like they're talking about the crayfish. But I'm like, it's at NCSA. They need to have a picture of two cray supercomputers. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Do we have time for questions or? Oh, thanks. It scale well? Um, no. <laughs> there's, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's this trade off between um, usability and, and speed. Uh, I, I yield the floor to ClickHouse. It was, it's pretty impressive what you can do with the SQL. But uh, you might not be able to do everything that you could with awk with SQL. SQL is a pretty adept language. But I don't know how, how much they implement into it. And then there's other tools. You know, I mean, you could write your own tool. There was another uh, script called BroAuk uh, that I came across when I was searching for what's the name uh, Bach. And, uh, and it was a re-implementation of Auk to do parallelization and be faster. But uh, it was not a complete Auk implementation. So you couldn't do everything that you could with Auk. Like a lot of these examples just wouldn't work because it probably wouldn't handle arrays and stuff like that. If the uh, author of that is in the room, <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But it, it seemed like it was, it was his own re-implementation of Auk. So it wasn't, it wasn't quite complete. Uh, so I wanted to be able to use all the functionality of Auk, but just be able to have the, you know, um, the quickness of being able to you know, memorize the column names and reference it. So yeah, I mean, awk, you know, it's, it's faster than looking through it with less <laughs> and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's not fast when you compare it with these, these much more specialized programs. Um, thanks.
Robin. You probably know that Brocut used to be written in R. Yes, Seth told me. He said I should talk to you after, <laughs> after this. That was speed theory wrote it in Right, right. Well, I mean, there's no reason why Bach couldn't be rewritten to be an implementation, you know, that is an expanded version of awk and is built for parallelization and stuff. But, but then you also have the whole um, something like uh, Brickhouse or Clickhouse or, uh, yeah, so, uh, is, is loading it into a binary log format. And, and you know, that's going to be much faster um, indexing it and all this stuff. So any other questions? Everybody's falling asleep. Stay awake for the next talk, you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs>